Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on this lovely, very warm August afternoon for our Germination Strategy Session webinar on the accredited seed treatment operations standards. I hope you can all hear me well, and I hope your screens are all clear. You should be seeing a slide, a title slide, that says New Accredited Seed Treatment Operations Standards. Are you ready? I just want, first of all, my name is Patty Townsend, and I'm going to be your host, moderator, whatever you want to call me. Just don't call me late for lunch. Haha. -ha. Anyway, um, I wanted to um, just make sure that you know that if you wish to ask questions, you will see a chat box on the left hand side of your screen. Just type those questions in. We will have a question session at the end of this, and uh, we, will, uh, we will provide the questions to our speaker. So let's get started. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to our sponsors for this strategy session and this webinar, Bayer, Syngenta, Secan, FP Genetics, and 2020 Seed Labs. It wouldn't be possible for us to do these sorts of things without their, without their contributions, both in terms of financial contributions and contributions of information and advice. Just quickly to our agenda, I'm, we're partway through number one, doing introductions and process. And uh, our presenter will take about 45 to 50 minutes to do his presentation. We will have time for questions and comments and some conclusions. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker today. Uh, his name is Russell Hurst. He is the Vice President, Sustainability and Stewardship with CropLife Canada. CropLife Canada is the National Trade Association representing the plant science industry and CropLife's members develop, manufacture, and distribute crop production and plant biotechnology products. Russell's main responsibilities include the management of the industry's national stewardship initiatives from product discovery through safe use to their ultimate disposal. He's also the executive director of the Agrochemical Warehousing Standards Association, which is the uh, capacity that he's speaking to us today. AWSA's mission is the continuous improvement of agrochemical warehouse performance in Canada through the establishment of standards to improve environmental protect protection, working conditions, and business risk. Russell was raised on a beef and cash crop farm in southwestern Ontario, where he still remains active in the family business. He holds an MBA in agriculture business, as well as a bachelor degree in agriculture from the University of Guelph. Prior to joining CropLife, he's worked in several progressive roles in the agronomy, grain sales, and management in both Canada and the United States. And most recently, before CropLife, he was a regional agronomy manager with a large farmer-owned cooperative in the Midwest United States. So without further ado, I will turn it to Russell, and go, Russell. Thanks, Patty. I appreciate the, uh, the introduction. I just want to make sure that you can hear me okay. We're hearing you well. Wonderful. Okay, so a couple things before I start. I just wanted to thank uh, Germination as well as the uh, strategy session sponsors. I think it's quite important that um, we have forums of this manner to uh, provide, a, provide a dialogue and a discussion moving forward around uh, key industry issues. And I, I hope everybody finds the discussion over the next hour uh, both enlightening and informative and, and any questions that they may have get answered in a, in a clear, concise manner. So what I'll try to uh, attempt to do over the next 45 minutes or so is provide um, some more context in terms of the uh, accredited seed treatment operation standards. I'll start with a little bit of background in terms of the development of the standards, the key drivers that went into the formation of these standards, then transition into how the standards were developed the components that went into that. I'll address some examples around how the, how the protocols are worded, how, one, how a facility would specifically comply with each, uh, each individual protocol example that I'll present, and then wrap up with some key questions that I think uh, every, every commercial seed treatment operation may have and, and do my best to to answer those questions in a, in a manner that hopefully is informative. And then ultimately, uh, towards the end of the discussion, we'll leave some time, as Patty noted, for uh, some question and answers if, if there are any areas that uh, additional clarity uh, is needed moving forward. 
so just a little bit of background in terms of the development of the, uh, of the accredited seed treatment standards. We had a couple drivers uh, that were initially in play when, uh, when, when the standards were conceived. And, and, and I'll walk through a couple of the, the key highlights that are associated with, uh, with the initial development phase. So the first one was um, we were having some additional environmental health and safety uh, complexities associated with uh, seed treatments uh, coming onto the marketplace. And, and we uh, first started developing these standards in 2009, so quite some time ago. But what we were, fi what we were finding at the time was uh, seed treatment products were becoming generally more complex and sophisticated. We were seeing the introduction of fungicide insecticide combinations. We were seeing the introduction of more precise application technologies coming into the marketplace. Um, in addition to that, we are finding registrants and regulators, we're looking to find some consistency through the evaluation and regulatory process. And, and, and if there isn't consistency, often what we find is uh, we default to the lowest documentable activity. And, and in some cases, that lowest documentable activity isn't ideal or isn't generally what the overall industry is doing in terms of uh, seed treatment application and handling processes. So we wanted to be able to provide, provide a standardized approach to seed treatment application and, and storage. I mean, in addition to that, um, probably not as any new news to anybody on the, on the webinar today, but the seed treatment uh, spectrum of the overall crop protection industry is one of the fastest growing market segments in Canada over those years. And I think that was another piece uh, that brought the prominence of seed treatment technologies uh, in a somewhat elevated manner in the Canadian marketplace over the past uh, uh, seven to ten years. Um, developing seed treatment standards isn't something that has been exclusive to the Canadian marketplace. What we are seeing is other jurisdictions, both in North America and at an international level, that are starting to go down the process at the time around developing standardized practices. And one of the key pieces that I would say is um, this is both um, we can learn lessons from what's going on at the international level, but it's also quite important to realize that seed treatment in different regions of the world and even in, uh, within Canada, in some cases, is quite different and, and complex. So what we tried to do in working with our international colleagues is, is look at both of those forums. Um, and then lastly, as CropLife Canada and its members, we've had a long uh, history of developing innovative stewardship programs uh, from stem to stern. And as Patty noted in, in the introduction, CropLife is very proud of the, uh, of the programs that we have in place that range from research and development through product use and responsible handling all the way to end of life management processes. And, and at the time when these standards were being uh, conceived, we really didn't have a lot of uh, stewardship activities specifically focused on the seed treatment sector of the industry. So there was also a driver in terms of developing some industry guidelines around the, the safe and responsible handling of seed treatment technologies. All that led into a discussion at the CropLife Canada board um, to develop a, a formation of a committee. And really what they were charged with was to develop a set of seed treatment standards for the commercial seed treatment sector of the industry. And I'll, I'll get into explaining a little bit uh, more around how we define commercial in terms of the commercial seed treatment industry in a little bit. Um, so what we did is we formed a committee. It was a multi-stakeholder committee. And really what we looked to do is develop a set of standards with a couple key guiding principles. They had to be practical. Um, we wanted them to be very uh, doable and implementable from an industry perspective. But they also needed to meet the wants and the needs of regulators that were at the table that were looking for consistency and understanding of seed treatment application processes and sometimes some quite uh, complicated seed treatment application processes, as well as meeting the needs of the industry and those individuals and those organizations and companies that are actually treating seed. So what we did is we, we developed a multi-stakeholder committee. And we really tried to populate it with four key components. Uh, components that existed of developers, so i.e. those companies that are registering and actively uh, distributing and marketing and selling seed treatment technologies into the Canadian marketplace, included ag retailers, both from a user perspective as well as a distributor perspective. 
We tried to include all aspects of the seed industry, and predominantly we tried to work through the various associations that represented the key constituencies within the seed treatment sector. So those would include the Canadian Seed Growers Association, the Canadian Seed Institute, the Alberta Seed Processors, and the Canadian Seed Trade Association. And last but not least, and this is really important, it was including government as part of the development and uh, dialogue throughout this process. And, and the two government groups that uh, chose to participate in the, uh, in the standards uh, stakeholder steering committee were both PMRA representatives as well as representatives from Alberta Environment. And really at the end of the day when we first started this process, we tried to develop a purpose statement. I always try to, to go back to this when we first started and, and really challenge our group when we were going through this process to say why are we here in the first place? And ultimately at the end of the day and going through this process, we wanted to be able to develop and implement improved stewardship practices for the storage and use of seed treatment products in the Canadian marketplace. And that's ultimately what we, what we attempted to do first starting in 2009. So moving forward, um, in terms of developing a set of standards, there was a, a couple of key drivers that we tried to incorporate as we were going through this journey. So the first one was um, there are a suite of industry stewardship programs already in existence in Canada. Um, some of the more prominent ones are the chemical warehousing standards that are developed and managed by AWSA for the CropLife Canada members the anhydrous ammonia standards and the ammonium nitrate standards, which are uh, fertilizer Canada-based standards, but they're also on a on a day-to-day -day standpoint managed by the AWSA program. So there was existing standards out there in a process that had been fairly successful at an industry level already out there. Um, the second piece was we wanted to address and in some instances reduce the environmental health and safety concerns associated with seed treatment products and application that were flagged by various stakeholders. So we went through a process of identifying potential risks and looking at mitigation strategies that as an industry we could standardize and implement. We wanted to create a set of standards that were predictable, documentable, and the key piece is repeatable. Um, from a stewardship protocol standpoint. So really what we try to develop from a standards process is standards that a facility can implement and undertake 365 days of the year if they were happen to be treating seed 365 days of the year. But also easily understandable. We want to put them in, in language that is easily comprehensible by a wide range of uh, stakeholders which would include regulators as well as government um, folks in addition to industry folks as well as actual users of the product. Um, and really what that would, would focus on is making sure that we're quite consistent across the board. We want to develop these standards in a pre-competitive level. So what we mean by that is um, that there would be a base level of protocol that the entire commercial seed treatment sector would adhere to. Um, essentially a, a, a bottom floor if you will and everybody would come to that level and so that within the Canadian marketplace if you're a commercial seed treatment operation you would meet the standard. And a couple other things before we, we get into the specifics around uh, the components of developing the standards, but this is really important from a development standpoint as we go through this process. We wanted to make sure that all the stakeholders associated with seed treatment use were involved in the development process. So as I noted before, when we get into the multi-stakeholder steering committee that was charged with, with drafting and developing these protocols, it's imperative that when we go through this process that all the stakeholders were at the table. And then this is really important in the sense of everybody that has a vested interest in the use of seed treatment products was at the table in terms of developing these standards. And, and uh, ultimately it wasn't one group um, going off on their own developing something. It was a very collaborative effort uh, throughout the process. And then the last piece here is um, one of the key pieces when we work in collaboration with, with, with the regulators as noted as part as membership of our multi-stakeholder steering committee, that really alleviates us from getting in a situation where requirements and standards are being dictated to the industry. Really what we like to, what we like to focus on 
is standards development and implementation in collaboration with all stakeholders. So there isn't a situation where um, a segment of the industry is being told what to do. We really like to try to address our issues in a collaborative manner and come out with a, a scenario and an, an end point that is um, understandable and implementable by all parties involved. So a little bit in terms of the, the granular aspects of the, uh, of the standards. So we went through this entire process. We ended up with 80 specific audit protocols. And I'll get into a couple examples in a few minutes here. 68 of those 80 protocols are existing regulations in one form or another. So those regulations would, would include aspects of fire codes, building codes, labor codes, occupational health and safety codes, and so on and so on. Some of those codes are going to be national or federal in nature. Others are going to be provincial in scope. But really, 68 of those 80s are going to be law in one form or another. And the other aspect when we were developing these protocols is we looked at a whole host of best management practices that are generally accepted within the industry. We looked at a host of product label statements that uh, an operator would find specifically on the product label around product use, handling, and safety. Uh, as well, we looked at a, a handful of guidelines that were developed by Health Canada, the Seed Trade Association, the Seed Growers Association, as well as several Crop Life Canada members. And really what we did is we took all of those best management practices, statements, guidelines, and existing regulations and put them together to develop this standard. Uh, so, so throughout that process, we did have a significant amount of dialogue, um, slight modifications and clarifications of the protocols based on our multi-stakeholder steering committee that all of these protocols were vested through, and uh, a, signific a significant amount of dialogue took place. So this first started in 2009. Um, by 2000, late 2013, early 2014, we were actually ready to release the draft standard. And uh, when we went through that process, I can't underemphasize the value that all of the stakeholders uh, put into this development process. Um, so where we ended up is the scope of the standards being applicable to, and I'll walk through a couple of these key pieces, the storage of seed treatment products prior to application. So that would be the storage of concentrated seed treatment products, whether they're in a jug, a drum, a tote, um, container in one form or another. So you would like to see this, the standards encompass the storage aspect at the seed treatment facility. They encompass the actual seed treatment application process. So i.e., the seed treatment being applied to the particular seed and the application process of how that seed treatment product is applied to the seed, how it's baffled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Once that seed exits that treatment process, typically it will enter either a bag, a tote box, a tote sack, or it will go into a gravity wagon or a truck or some form of bulk transport. So once that seed exits the treatment process, the scope of the standards end. Once it, once it goes into that, transpor that transportation mode or into a container, there are, there are already applicable regulations uh, that deal with that, specifically CFIA regulations, and in some cases, some PMRA label regulations. So that's beyond the scope of the standard. The other thing that we tried to include within the scope of the standard is all various treatment processes. So within the standards, it's applicable to see treatment processes taking place in an indoor environment, in an exterior environment, as well as mobile seed treatment operations. So we tried to include all of the specific aspects of seed treatment processes, whether it's indoor, outdoor, or truly mobile within the standards. In terms of how we broke the standards out, there's, they go into uh, each specific key area within the standards. And this is a fairly similar process to how a lot of the other industry development standards uh, take place. We split them out into key functionable areas. So in this case for the seed treatment standards, section A being citing and exterior requirements. So 
So within a particular operation, we have eight protocols that are applicable to how that seed treatment facility is sited in a particular operation in terms of its general environment. In section B, which includes building structure and equipment, as noted, those deal specifically with the building that the seed treatment storage and seed treatment application take place in. Operational aspects, we would be uh, specific to standard operating procedures that a facility would go through in terms of how they manage their operation. Training, documentation, employee knowledge, and emergency response being the other components. So within those standards, you'll see that some standards are mandatory, some are scored items, and some are recommended. And I'll just walk through what that means uh, specifically for each of those protocols. So for a mandatory protocol, fairly self-explanatory, um, the operation in this case must comply with the specific protocol. In many cases, the mandatory protocols are law or are a regulation in one form or another, either federally or provincially in a host of provinces. There are also protocols that as industry and the multi-stakeholder steering committee going through this process felt quite, str quite strongly that all facilities, if they are a commercial seed treatment operation, would need to comply with this protocol. So those are mandatory protocols. Scored items. So those are protocols that have a specific point value attributed to them within the standards. Within each of the sections, so for instance section A, the facility would need to achieve a scoring of 80% or greater to achieve compliance. And why we, why we developed scored items was for a couple reasons. Typically scored items are scenarios that maybe aren't a regulation or aren't specifically a, uh, a federal requirement, but they are a protocol that as industry we feel quite strongly that a facility needs to uh, comply with. The reason why we score them is it provides some flexibility to a seed treatment operation. In some cases, um, that particular protocol may not fit their operation uh, operationally, logistically, or just how they choose to run their business. And one thing to keep in mind, from a seed treatment sector, there is a great deal of variability depending on how a particular operation uh, applies the seed treatment product, the type of commodities that they are applying seed treatment product to, and so on and so on. So what we tried to do is build in some flexibility so that all operations, uh, in some cases, can pick protocols that meet um, their wants and needs from an environmental health and safety uh, protocol, but also builds in some flexibility if there's a protocol uh, within the standards that just doesn't fit operationally within their facility, they can choose to forfeit the points in that particular scenario, but still pass uh, the overall uh, assessment. The third piece is recommended items. And recommended items within the standards are simply that. They're recommended, there is no penalty if that protocol is not achieved, it's simply a recommendation that the industry felt strong enough that we wanted to include them in the standards, but we didn't want to penalize a facility for going through the process. So, no, so as an example, one of the recommended protocols is that a facility has 24-hour security monitoring of their facility. So in some cases, that could be a very applicable protocol um, whereas in other cases, if it's a seed treatment facility that is maybe only treating seed for a week to three weeks throughout the season, it's a protocol that may not fit quite well in that particular operation if it's, a, if it's truly a seasonal uh, type situation. So we allowed the facility um, some flexibility. As an industry, we would recommend that they have security monitoring, but they're not going to be penalized if they don't have it. So a couple other additional items that we brought into uh, into these standards. Um, we tried to take into account the existing provincial regulations um, and protocols that may be overlapped. And, and why we state that is, in some cases, and I'll give Alberta as an example, there's a, there's a fairly robust provincial regulatory regime in Alberta that deals with commercial seed treatment operations. So in those particular situations, what we do is we, uh, we grandfather or grant equivalency um, to many of those protocols if that 
facility can show that they are in compliance with the provincial regulations. So ulti ultimately what it does is it results in a lighter audit of those particular facilities if there are provincial requirements in their particular geography that, are, that fit within that operation. Whereas if a facility was in a province where there isn't a significant amount of existing provincial regulations, what it results in is that facility going through more of the specific protocols to achieve that base level of environmental health and safety um, at a national level. A couple other things that we wanted to, to deal with from a standards applicability uh, component. Um, some operations, as noted, uh, within the seed treatment sector, there's a great deal of variability depending on the particular operation, the application process, the type of uh, commodities that that particular operation is treating in, as well as whether that facility is treating indoors or uh, an exterior treating facility or a mobile treating facility. So in a lot of cases, um, there will be some protocols that as an auditor we would deem not applicable. And the prime example would be uh, a facility, if they are treating in an indoor nature, we would require active ventilation while that facility is in operation. If that facility is treating seed outdoors, think of a scenario where they're treating seed in a hopper bottom type scenario from a row of bins, they're treating outside, so ventilation in that case would be a non-applicable protocol. So what we tried to, tried to ensure is throughout the process and going through the audit protocols, um, if it was deemed non-applicable, that facility is essentially uh, not penalized for, an op for a protocol that isn't applicable to their particular operation. In addition to that, really what we tried to do is ensure that there's some flexibility as industry in going through the various uh, protocols. And lastly, what we tried to do is ensure that we have supporting documentation uh, as part of the manual. And I'll get into a little bit of this uh, in the next few slides. So we developed the protocol, the standards, but in addition to that, we try to ensure that there's some technical guidance within the standards as well as posted on the AWSA website. Um, so those will be additional clarifications, uh, bulletins that address a particular issue or a scenario um, that maybe a unique seed treatment operation would look for additional clarity in terms of how one would interpret a particular protocol. So we try to make sure that all of that additional information is posted in a public manner on the AWSA website. What I'd like to do now is walk through a couple protocol examples. And, and really the, the handful that I chose for the discussion today are, are really based on a couple things. Um, primarily, these are where we get the most amount of questions into the AWSA office. So I thought this was a good forum to be able to uh, provide some examples of the protocols and how they're specifically interpreted. So in the first example that I have here, which is protocol A1, um, if you go back to how we uh, develop the standards, we put them into each section. So protocol A1 deals with siting and exterior requirements. So in this case, the protocol is a mandatory protocol and it states that all storage and fixed seed treatment areas are located at distances in excess of 30 meters from an environmentally sensitive area. So what we really ultimately mean by that is we don't want seed treatment application practices taking place adjacent to environmentally sensitive areas. So we use the 30 meter buffer zone because it's typically a provincial regulatory distance. Um, so what we define, and this is when we get into the auditor specific notes, so what is an environmentally sensitive area? So we use the Alberta environment uh, explanation or uh, uh, description being an environmentally sensitive area is a lake, stream, or wetland that contains some wildlife. It is not a ditch that tends to run wet or a dugout is not considered an environmentally sensitive area. So really what we're looking for is areas that have permanent water 365 days of the year that may contain wildlife. What we would look for is that a facility not be located adjacent to an environmentally sensitive area. But we include a grandfather clause. And the, the concept behind a grandfather clause would be we do not want to penalize a facility for being in existence before the standards came into place. 
and they were not aware of the protocol requirements. So basically what it states is if this facility completed a pre-audit, which I'll note in a, in a few minutes here during our pre-audit process, that's an existing facility and that facility would be granted compliance with this mandatory protocol because it was in existence prior to the standards being implemented. So that's the first protocol that I wanted to, to state. Moving forward, we would look for all new sea treatment operations to be located in distances in excess of 30 meters from a defined environmentally sensitive area. Protocol A8 is another example and it deals with specifically with signage. So within an operation, this protocol indicates within the storage and or sea treatment buildings, we're looking for a host of signs. The first is emergency exits and exit routes within the building. We're looking for an emergency supply cabinet that would keep personal protective equipment in that cabinet. We would look for spill cleanup equipment, which would include uh, absorbent material, typically a shovel, a pail, um, in the event of a spill. We would look for a fire extinguisher or extinguishers present within the operation. We would look for portable or fixed eyewash stations. And lastly, we would look for external fire lane markings within and around the building. So in some cases, this may be non-applicable. So as an example, for a mobile unit, we noted within A8, section B, C, D, and E are applicable. Section A being emergency exit routes within the building. If you're truly a mobile treater, you would not be treating in a building. So that, in that case, it would be deemed non-applicable. The next protocol, B7. So this deals with retention curbing in an operation. And I'll break this example into part A and part B, and then provide some examples of how a facility could potentially achieve this protocol. So for B7A, within the seed treatment storage area, so think exclusively an area within the operation that is specifically for the storage of concentrated seed treatment products in jugs, drums, or totes. We would ask that that area have curbing of 10 centimeters in height around the perimeter of the, sp of the specific or defined containment area, i.e., that facility has spill containment. It can be achieved in a whole host of ways, which I'll explain momentarily. For section B7B, we're talking specifically the seed treatment area. The seed treatment area has curbing of 10 centimeters in height around the perimeter of the specific seed treatment area. Two things of note here. The storage area is a mandatory protocol. B7B, the seed treatment area, is a scored protocol. So from a from an, uh, protocol standpoint, if the facility is storing concentrated product on their premises, it needs to be in a diked secure storage area. If the operation is only treating seed, does not store product, just brings in just-in-time delivery, uh, that application area, we would like to see it in a diked type situation, but if they choose to forfeit the points, that facility could conceptually pass the audit without having diking, but they would need to achieve several other environmental health and safety criteria in that operation to ensure that in the event of a spill, that that facility has appropriate mitigation strategies in place. A little bit of context around how a facility may achieve these type of diking scenarios. So the first scenario would be curbing of 10 centimeters may be constructed of concrete so a typical ag retail warehouse type of scenario, cement floor with poured cement diking around the treatment area and or storage area. They can also have steel curbing. So think angle iron at a height of 10 centimeters around the key storage and or treatment areas. 
The other opportunity that a facility may choose to use is implementing baffled spill pallets in, in their operations. And I'll try to explain somewhat around what a baffled spill pallet is. So typically with a baffled spill pallet, we see them used uh, predominantly in the oil and gas sector. Um, what they are is they're a rigid molded plastic pallet that has a grid on the top where a seed treatment product would be set. Within that baffled pallet, it has an area in the event of a spill that that product would through gravity go down through the grid and be held in that baffled pallet as a catchment. So what we would say is in those particular facilities, if, a, if an operation wanted to achieve their spill containment through baffled pallets, that would be perfectly acceptable. They would not need to pour concrete. They would not need to have a metal retaining uh, angle iron wall around their operation, but all products would have to sit on baffled spill pallets. The other component of those baffled spill pallets is that they need to have 110% capacity for the largest container that is sitting on that pallet. So as an example, if there was a 100 liter container sitting on that, pa that baffled pallet, that pa baffled pallet would need to have a retention volume of 110 liters within that baffled pallet. Typically, those baffled pallets will have a stamp on the side of it that indicates the holding capacity of, of, those particular, uh, of that particular model, if you will. So what we tried to do in terms of this protocol is build in some scenarios where an operation, if they choose not to pour concrete um, or implement ma metal sheeting to achieve spill containment, there are other avenues that a facility may choose to engage to achieve compliance with this protocol. Protocol B13 deals with ventilation. And I'll walk through this one fairly rapidly. One of the key components of ensuring uh, a safe work environment is in the seed treatment application area that there's adequate ventilation for safe for a safe work environment. And how we define that is two air changes per hour in that primary treatment area while the operation is actively treating seed. So how we get there is through what we call a CFM calculation. It's a fairly simple calculation. I'm not going to walk through it in the example today, but what I can provide everybody is it's, it's an example. Essentially what the facility does is they walk through the specific length, width, and height of the operation and ensure that they have a fan to achieve at a minimum two air changes per hour. So within a fan, you would have a specific rating on the side of the fan. What we would ultimately look for is that that rating on the side of that fan has a, has a fan speed in excess of the CFM for the specific seat treatment area. The next example that I wanted to give before we do some wrap-up uh, questions uh, that I wanted to walk through everybody is protocol G1. And one of the key components within the standards is documentation at the facilities. And specifically, ensuring that every facility has an emergency response plan within their operation in the event of an emergency. And what we've found as an industry over the past 20 years is in the event of emergency, if there is a well thought out emergency response plan that can be acted upon in a very rapid manner, the scale and the scope of the emergency is significantly reduced as well as the particular environmental uh, fate within a particular operation if it involves a seed treatment product or specifically a pesticide spill. So we've seen that these things work if they're easily comprehensible and easily acted upon. So within the emergency response plan, what we would ask for is a facility uh, walk through org chart of all key people within the operation key telephone numbers of emergency responders, employees, local medical facilities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. a drawing of the site plan so that they know where in the operation seed treatment products are being stored, where they're being applied, and any other applicable areas in the event of an emergency, 
we would look for some comprehension around in the event of a fire where water would be applied to the operation or where it may end up as part of runoff. As well, we want a list of who the ER plan has been distributed to in the location of a product inventory list so that in the event of an emergency, the first responders can have a very clear understanding of the type of products, of C treatment products specifically, that are located at that particular facility and that will ultimately allow them to have the appropriate personal protective equipment in place when they manage this particular emergency in the event of a spill or anything else that would happen. So we asked the facility to go through that whole process. So what I tried to do there is show everybody some examples of the particular protocols that we would have a facility go through. Of the 80 protocols, those are the ones that we get by far the most amount of questions on. Uh, as well, I would say in any typical operation, approximately 50 to 55 of the protocols would be applicable in any one operation, and approximately 20 to 25 protocols would probably be non-applicable depending on the particular operation's uh, treatment structure, the type of products that they're using, the type of commodities that they're applying uh, C treatment products to. So as I wrap up here, I'll walk through the audit process and some of the questions that, that typically come up um, into our office over the, past, uh, over the past couple of years. So initially in 2014, the draft version of the, C, of the accredited C treatment operation standards were released. And as an incentive, what we tried to do is we tried to encourage facilities to go through a pre-audit process in late 2014 and into 2015. And there was a couple uh, key drivers in going through this process. Um, the first one was there was no penalty for a facility to go through the process. There was no obligation for the facility to complete, an to complete a full audit prior to the implementation of the standards. Our real primary goal was to provide all commercial seed treatment operations with a gap assessment of what their current practices were as compared to what we were asking for in terms of the standards. In addition to that, it allowed them several years um, from 14, 15 to 16, 17 to analyze how their facilities could come up to the speed as to what we were asking for. And I, I would share with everybody that uh, what we found is we can generally break down the pre-audits into three groups. The, the, the first group would be facilities that generally speaking were uh, fairly compliant with everything that we were asking for, really in those particular operations where uh, a few minor tweaks in terms of how they document activities or a few uh, specific documentation activities that they maybe weren't doing that we would ask them to do. The, the middle third were facilities that generally speaking may have a few structural upgrades to do in their particular operations to meet some of the specific protocols. As an example, they maybe didn't have uh, adequate ventilation in the seed treatment area so they would look to upgrade their facilities to ensure that the, that there's two air changes per hour achieved in their operations. And the other third of the operations realistically would have some significant uh, upgrades to do to their particular operation. In many cases, it's a lot of documentation upgrades, but in other cases, it may be some physical uh, structural upgrades. That noted, within the protocols, we tried to ensure that there was a reasonable amount of flexibility within the standards. Uh, to allow those particular facilities to achieve compliance without, in, in many cases, what we're hoping for is, uh, you know, without significant capital cost in terms of their operations. So after this entire process, uh, 483 sites uh, went through this pre-audit process. We have some, some regional breakdowns across the country, which I won't go through uh, in a whole lot of detail with everybody today. But the other thing I wanted to share is we tried to break uh, the process down into various market segments. So what we found is um, we had a pretty good cross-section within the market segment of the industry between ag retail facilities, which we would deem as AWSA certified facilities that are doing seed treatments, uh, certified seed growers, so those would be uh, growers that are treating seed uh, as part of their pedigreed seed business, so they'd be growing the seed as well as treating it as part of their, uh, their uh, 
seed selling process, uh, seed cleaning co-ops, which are predominantly in Western Canada, and then lastly, specifically seed companies uh, that weren't growing seed for themselves, but were strictly focused on uh, cleaning seed and treating it as part of a business uh, scenario. So we walked through that process. Um, we were quite happy with the uptake in terms of the, uh, of the pre the pre-audits uh, for the facilities, and I think generally speaking, uh, it was it was good value for all the facilities to go through the process to understand what was within the the specific protocols, to be able to digest them, compartmentalize them in terms of siting requirements, building requirements, documentation requirements, training requirements, so that it was uh, palatable for all of the operations to get through and didn't become an overwhelming. Uh, audit process, so it gives them a very clear understanding of, of what we were asking for from an industry standpoint. Uh, moving forward, I tried to address a couple questions that we typically get into uh, when we get requests from our uh, uh, the various seed seed facilities across the country. So um, before I wrap up, I just tried to have three questions that we typically get. So what's a seed treatment audit look like? So here's, here's a little bit of information in terms of what the process is like. So across the country, we have 28 trained AWSA auditors that are available to do audits nationally. This is an audit group. We have uh, auditors from BC to the East Coast. Uh, obviously, we have a higher density of auditors in Western Canada, Ontario, and Quebec just due to the, uh, the nature of the seed treatment business in those particular areas of the country. Um, and they can essentially uh, perform uh, an audit on behalf of AWSA. Typically, that process is it's up to the facility. Um, they can contact any of those 28 accredited auditors. There is not an auditor attributed to a specific geography. Um, they can audit wherever they, uh, wherever they so choose to. Typically, um, auditors will focus on particular geographies in and around where, uh, where their home base is. Um, we have uh, mutually agreed upon audit date and time, so it's entirely up to the individual facility and the auditor to agree upon a time where that auditor would visit their particular operation and go through the audit. So what the actual audit looks like is that auditor will physically visit the seed treatment facility. They will review the physical operations, i.e., the treatment area and the storage area, and review the documentation within that particular facility. They'll complete the audit form, which is essentially a checklist that they review with the particular facility. If the facility complies, they, get, they grant a pass on that particular protocol. Any non-applicable non protocols are granted non-applicable. They move on. If there are any protocols that the facility is currently not in compliance with, the auditor will flag that with the particular operation, and that operation will be required um, if it's a scored protocol, they can forfeit their points. If it's a mandatory protocol, that facility will be required to come into compliance with that. They'll have to show the auditor um, either during the audit or subsequently after if documentation is required. Um, post that, the auditor will sign off on that audit that it, uh, that it is a pass. Upon that time, the AWSA office will issue a certificate of accreditation for that facility indicating that they have successfully fulfilled the audit requirements and are a certified facility. In terms of the timing, a typical audit takes approximately three hours. Now that also ultimately depends on the size and the scale and the scope of the operation. Smaller, concise facilities take generally significantly less time, whereas if it's a more complex operation, typically take more. In addition to that, the facility's relative level of organization when the auditor visits, if the facility has all of their documentation ready and prepared in an easily legible format, the audit ultimately takes less time, whereas if there's a bit of searching or um, the documentation isn't in an easily accessible format, then typically it takes a little bit more time to go through. In terms of the audit cost, that cost is negotiated directly between the auditor and the operation. Typically, we give a guideline of, of approximately $500 for the audit to be completed, but that is entirely negotiable between the individual AWSA auditor and the specific operation going through the audit. 
And then lastly, in terms of the audit frequency, uh, we're looking to have an audit completed every two calendar years. So as an example, if a facility was to complete an audit in 2016, the next audit would be required before end of calendar year 2018. The next audit would be 2020, 2022, and so on. Um, where we landed on every two calendar years is generally it's an industry uh, standard that we've seen with the uh, other suite of uh, industry standardized audits that take place is that, that an audit would be required every two calendar years. One of the other questions is, I'm a, I'm a commercial seed treatment facility. Do I need to complete an audit? So really what we wanted to provide here is the scope of these standards are aimed at commercial seed treatment operations. Um, we use the definition that Alberta Environment uses is uh, the definition for a commercial seed treatment operation would be applying a seed treatment product for sale or gain. Um, the standards encompass. One of the other questions we typically get is, I'm a mobile treater. Do I need to go through this process? These standards encompass treatment activities that take place indoors, exterior, and in a mobile treatment operation. They do not take into account on-farm seed treatment application. A grower that is looking to apply seed treatment on-farm for their own purposes are beyond the scope of the accredited seed treatment operation standards. In terms of support from CropLife Canada member registrants, CropLife Canada member registrants will articulate their specific seed treatment products that are intended for the commercial segment of the industry. So we'll call those designated seed treatment products um, as per their label guidelines in intended use. The other thing that we want to make sure is 2017 onward, only commercial seed treatment operations that have successfully completed a seed treatment audit will be able to receive these designated seed treatment products. That will be dictated by the CropLife members. The registrants that have those particular seed treatment products will indicate that this, that, that specific product is only to be used in a commercial operation. That commercial operation, therefore, would have to pass the seed treatment standards. Um, last two questions before I wrap up. What timelines do I need to be aware of? So any facility com can complete a seed treatment audit now. A couple things. We're, we will look to implement the standards fully January 1st, 2017. So sites are encouraged to complete an audit prior to that implementation timeline. Those facilities that completed a pre-audit will be granted grandfather clauses for specific building and siting structural components, i.e., as the example that I provided uh, before, if they're located within 30 meters of an environmentally sensitive area, we will not penalize them because they were in existence prior to the standards coming in, uh, into force. Um, that said, those facilities will need to complete an audit prior to that January 1, 2017 window. Facilities can still complete an audit after that January 1, 2017 window. They just won't have the grandfathering clauses that they were granted as part of that pre-audit process. And the, the, last, uh, the last question that we typically get is, where can I get more information about the standards? So what we try to do is post as much information in a public forum as possible. And we try to post everything on our AWSA website. That's going to include a protocol manual. One thing I would note, if anybody would like a hard copy of the protocol manual, please uh, send us an email and we'll make sure that one gets sent in the mail. Um, but the protocol manual is electronic in, in a PDF format. There's a list of all the auditors and their specific contact information. In addition to that, um, when tech technical documents are developed, we ensure that those are uh, posted on the website in support of the standards. Um, the other thing I would uh, make note of is that the CropLife Canada members uh, who supply seed treatment products into the marketplace 
have uh, incredibly knowledgeable staff, both in a, uh, a technical and a uh, support mechanism. And please, uh, those facilities um, that have uh, direct relationships with those uh, individual CropLife members, please ask them um, for information in support, of, uh, in support of the standards because they do have a lot of information that will aid facilities in going through uh, the documentation aspects of the standards. And uh, lastly, a couple things that I just wanted to share with everybody before we wrap it up and open it up to questions. So this process has taken a, a significant amount of time. We're into the seventh year since, uh, since uh, 2009 where the standards were first uh, conceived. This has been a, a very long process, but I, I do want to emphasize that uh, we took our time in developing these standards because we really wanted to include all the stakeholders that were involved in the seed treatment industry to be able to provide their input, their opinions, their feedback, and, and be part of the development process throughout. And I think that's really important moving forward that um, one, of, one of our key uh, critical areas of success that we wanted to be able to show in going through this process that was that all the stakeholders had a vested interest in this process and felt that they were part of the development moving forward. Um, the other piece that we wanted to show is that the standards, really what we're looking for is to allow the entire uh, seed treatment industry to take a common approach to environmental health and safety practices within the commercial seed treatment sector at a national level. So we've seen some really good uh, work being done at the provincial level, but really what we tried to focus on is as an industry we want to have a national standard that all commercial seed treatment facilities would be able to achieve from an environmental health and safety standpoint. What we tried to do is take into account all the regulations that would be applicable across the country as well as best management practices and what we think we have at the end of the day is a really robust document that takes into account both regulation as well as best management practices. And the last piece is really the focus on working in collaboration with all of our stakeholders which would include government, industry and users of the product and really what we're looking for at the end of the day is, the, is ultimately improved stewardship practices at the national level and really what we're looking for is in the future the betterment of the industry and to safeguard access to new seed tra treatment technologies now and in the future. So really with that I'll, uh, I'll wrap things up Patty and uh, would certainly uh, be more than happy to entertain any questions uh, with, uh, with our remaining time. Thank you very much, Russell. That was really informative and very well presented. I understood it very well. We have just a few questions. Two of them actually apply to um, credits that are available for participating in this webinar, and we'll try and answer some of the questions separately with, uh, with Issues, Inc., but there is um, one question that we have for you, and the question is, can I get a credit for my seed treatment applicator endorsement from this webinar? I believe you should be able to. Um, so that would be entirely up to the, um, the granting body. So for instance, say in Alberta, it would be Alberta Environment, but I, my, my gut instinct would be I think this would be a, um, a very applicable um, forum to get, to get those credits applied towards. So for the, the person who asked the question, perhaps we could at Issues Inc. explore that a little bit further so we can get a broader bit of information and provide that directly to the people that participated in the webinar. So the other question uh, that we have is, in the protocol manual it says we need label training which will be available on the AWSA website. When will this training be available? Uh, good question. So um, maybe I'll take a step back. We ask for label training as part of uh, the protocols. There's a couple avenues that an operation uh, can achieve their label training through. So the first one would be if there is a provincial uh, training program that is available, typically those are delivered by the provincial ministries of either agriculture or environment. If an operator goes through that specific uh, training and education program, that would be granted equivalency for achieving label training because typically in those, in those provincial programs, a key component or a key educational component uh, would be label comprehension. 
that noted, if a facility chooses not to go through that route, um, specifically uh, Crop Life Canada members, uh, as part of their uh, supporting activities, typically undertake label training specifically on, on products uh, as part of a support mechanism, and they'll provide evidence that uh, training has been completed, and that would serve as uh, evidence that a facility has gone through label training. And the third piece is, um, with, uh, within the AWSA website, uh, we will provide a uh, brief PowerPoint uh, training and education module. Um, we're just working with the University of Guelph, uh, Ridgetown College, to develop that. It should be posted on our uh, website probably towards the end of this month. We're just going through the, the final legal sign-offs there. But typically what that would be is it would be a 10-slide uh, PowerPoint training process that an operation could go through. Upon successfully answering 10 questions at the end of that, it would auto-generate a certificate for the particular operator to indicate that they have uh, a base level of, of label comprehension and awareness. So there's ultimately uh, three different avenues a facility could go through to achieve that label training uh, protocol compliance. Okay, great. So one other um, applying, I guess, specifically to AWSA information is, are you going to accumulate a list of designated products? Yeah. So that is uh, currently uh, we're working on that, Patty. Um, it's ultimately the, the obligation of each registrant to indicate those products that are used or that they feel would be used exclusively in a commercial nature. So once those particular registrants have formally designated those products, we will ensure that those products, i.e. trade name, PCP number, uh, are on the AWSA website as a designated product. But ultimately, um, what we would look for is indication from the particular registrant to uh, provide that um, first as, as they are the, uh, the registrant owner, if you will. But will they be accumulating that to you, and will you be able to put out a list, or will, will that just be specifically the responsibility of the registrant? So the first phase will be the registrant will indicate that, and then once they have formally indicated that, we will keep a uh, registry of all seed treatment products that have been provided um, that designated status on the AWSA website, Patty. So um, what I would encourage is individual companies as part of their product support and, and technical, uh, technical training uh, capacity in their relationships with seed treatment facilities, they, they'll be able to speak to their own specific products. But in addition to that, we will keep a registry of all CropLife Canada members' uh, products on the AWSA website. Okay, I have another, another credit question here that I missed. I'm sorry. It says, in addition to the education credits listed, and I don't understand the acronyms, but I'm sure you will, are CCSC credits for the Crop Life CEUs also an option? They certainly would be. Um, what we try to do is any, any uh, accredited training forum, Patty, whether that would be a certified crop science consultant, whether that would be a certified crop advisor, or in some provinces the various provincial um, licenses have various CEUs attributed to those. Um, ultimately what we try to do is make sure that if a facility or an operator is going through any one of those quote unquote accredited processes that we would grant equivalency for. Okay. Oh, we got another one here. Um, regarding my question that Russell's answering now, I have a seed treatment applicator's license. Would that will that cover my label training requirements? Absolutely. So, in provinces such as uh, Saskatchewan in Alberta, where an operator would have to have a license, a key component of that license would be label training. Uh, another component would be application training, and so on and so on. But in those cases. We're very sensitive to uh, allowing a facility, if they're going through existing training and education processes, to be able to take credit for that and not have to go through um, an addition, uh, additional training as long as it meets what we're looking for from an industry. So in that case, if they have a provincial pesticide license and as part of that license they go through the training or label training, if you will, that would be granted equivalency. So as part of the audit process, what that operation or operator would look to do is provide the auditor um, uh, a copy of that particular license. It would have to be in good standing or, or uh, 
uh, if you will, current, and uh, and that would be granted. Okay. The, the key okay. piece, Patty. Uh, excuse me. The key piece, Patty, is we're not looking for facilities to have to duplicate what they're already doing if they have good management processes already in place. It's really about taking credit for what you're doing, but as an industry to be able to say, as an industry we have a baseline or a benchmark environmental health and safety criteria associated with commercial seed treatment operations and, uh, and that as a whole they all comply with that. In some cases, and in many cases, facilities may be going beyond what we're asking for, and, and, th and that's, uh, that's a good thing um, moving forward, but what we're looking for is, is that base level. Okay, so just to sum that up, I did get a note from Ms. Zink saying that participants on this call get one CEU in the area of crop management, and that a form was attached in the email that was sent with the login information. Any other information you have, any questions you have after that, you could send to uh, Issues Inc. and we'll see if we can try to get answers for you. So we have a couple more questions and we're running a bit over time. One of them is, will a commercial facility be allowed to sell commercial seed treatment products to producers? Uh, good question. So I'll maybe uh, take a step back. So. Um, if a commercial seed treatment operation is treating seed and they're an ag retail facility that would, that would typically sell a suite of herbicides, insecticides, fungicides to growers or end users, that would be perfectly fine. Um, what, what a facility would not be able to do would be to sell a designated seed treatment product, i.e. a seed treatment product that is deemed for commercial use only to a grower for end use treatment. Okay, and one last question. Protocol G1, Emergency Response Organizational Chart, all of the points listed, how do you put that one in one chart? Are there examples of what a chart would look like? Yeah, good question. So um, depending on the particular facility, um, if it's a, a sole operator, um, the, the org chart is relatively simple, um, whereas if it's a more, uh, if, if there's a number of employees, that typically uh, um, gets a bit more uh, complicated. So in terms of, of, of a chart, really what we are looking for is as long as it's meaningful to the particular operation, uh, any individual that has seed treatment storage and or treatment responsibilities be included in that that particular org chart. Ideally, it's one page. If it takes more than that, that's probably fine. The key piece within the emergency response plan is um, that all individuals that have responsibility within the organization or the operation, um, whether it's seed treatment product storage or application, are aware of the emergency procedures. Typically, we find is if we ask for an org chart, that's the best forum to ensure that all operations have all employees that are involved in that process easily documented. So um, what we're looking for from an org chart is um, ideally it's one page in terms of, of um, uh, operations, but if it's in a more um, complicated type situation, it can certainly be broke down into various components of the seed treatment operation. So it may be a little hard to answer without getting specific into a site-by-site -site example, but um, what we're looking for is as long as that org chart is meaningful and it includes all of the key personnel and their roles and responsibilities, we would be fine with that from an audit process standpoint. Okay, well we've answered all of the questions. I hope they were answered satisfactorily. I understood very well. Thank you again for participating, and you can find this presentation on the Germination website very soon. I think we try for 48 hours or so, so check back for it. Uh, just a quick thank you again to our sponsors, Bayer, Syngenta, Secan, FP Genetics, and 2020 Seed Labs. And just a little stay tuned. We have two more strategy sessions upcoming this year. In September, we'll be talking about seed applied biologicals and micronutrients. And in November, we're going to talk about seed applied insecticides, an overview of the regulations in Canada and changes for 2017, and uh, we hope you'll be able to join us. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and uh, we look forward to helping you out and talking to you again in a month or so.